In today's video, we're gonna tell you how to take a common $20 drone and turn it into an RC blimp in about an hour. Welcome to Flight Test, guys. Today, we have a little bit different speed of a project. We are entering into the thick of winter here in Ohio, so having fun indoor projects is a great way to keep flying no matter what the weather is outside. These little RC blimps are a blast to fly. They're a little bit different than a micro drone because they have buoyancy and they can actually float. You can cut the throttle and kind of establish a glide slope. It's a much different flying experience than your typical indoor micro mini drone, which is what a lot of people fly throughout the winter. So without further ado, you can start by getting the drone out and putting it on the USB charger. You wanna make sure that the battery's charged as you get started building. Now, as for the drone that we are using, we're using these little Cheerson drones. We'll put a link down below. We've specifically used this one because it does not have a built-in barometer or an altitude hold. Now, this concept will work with many different types of drones, but the main thing is you wanna make sure it does not have that altitude hold. In other words, you wanna make sure that when you cut the throttle, the props come down to a halt. So first things first, you're gonna get out our trusty maker foam. Now you can also use your common foam core board from the dollar store, but we like to use our maker foam. It's a little bit easier to work with and it's also waterproof. First thing you're gonna do is cut a long strip of foam. Anything from about 1.5 inches to about two inches will work, but I just like to use the width of my ruler and just cut that strip of foam straight down the side. After that, you're gonna cut a four and a half inch strip. This strip is gonna be the base plate of your frame. Once you cut out the four and a half inch strip, you're gonna cut out an additional four inch strip. Cool thing about this is you can keep working off the same strip of foam that you originally cut out. Once you cut the four inch strip, you're gonna take that four inch strip and you're cut and cut it right down the middle, cutting it in half. These are gonna be your motor arms. After you have those motor arms, you're gonna cut a little half inch sliver. This is gonna be used as a riser to raise up the rear motor arm to give the props enough clearance so when the blimp lands, the props don't hit the ground. Take that half inch riser and glue it onto the back of the four and a half inch base plate piece of foam. Once the glue's dried, you can take that four inch motor arm and glue it directly on top, centered on top of the half inch riser. Now you're gonna take your other four inch motor arm and you're gonna glue that directly onto the front of the frame with no riser. This is gonna be positioned vertically. Once you're done, you should have something that looks a little bit like this. The cool thing about this project is it's pretty forgiving and you can actually make different types of frames and different size frames to get different performance. It's actually a really fun test bed to do some experimenting and learn how different geometry and different lengths of things can actually affect the flight performance. Before we get any further into this build, I wanted to take this time to tell you about our sponsor for this video, and that is Turo. Now, if you guys aren't familiar with Turo, Turo is a peer-to-peer -peer car sharing platform. iOS or Android device, or you can even use it in the browser. Now, the cool thing about this is it is a great way for you to get access or to borrow very unique cars all over the world, no matter where you go. So when you're out there traveling, instead of having to wait in line at a boring car rental place, you can use this app and get set up with a really unique car directly from the owner. The value of Turo is you can choose the best car for you at a lower cost than traditional rental services. With over 850 makes and models, Turo members are able to choose the exact car that you want. Think about which car you'd want, you're gonna find it on Turo. Great thing about Turo is it has cars in 5,500 cities across the US, Canada, Germany, and the UK. Now, if you're stuck somewhere like in an airport, they do offer delivery for added convenience. You can get the car wherever, whenever you want. So here's the cool thing. You guys can actually check out the link below. By using that link, you're actually gonna get $15 off your first Turo trip, which is pretty awesome. So huge shout out to Turo. It's because of awesome sponsors like Turo that we're able to make this content for you guys. So make sure you check out that link below. Again, use the coupon code FLIGHT15, all caps, to get 15 bucks off your first trip and let's get back to building. Once you're done with the frame, you're gonna take your little drone and you're gonna take the props off. These little props are just friction fit, so typically you can just pinch them off with your fingernail or get a flathead screwdriver or a razor blade to pry them off. You wanna be careful because you will need to reuse these props. Once you have your props off, you're gonna unscrew the four screws on the bottom. This is gonna disassemble the main frame of the quad. Once you have your four screws out, you can easily unclip each corner of the plastic frame to remove it. Inside, you'll see that the quad is actually just built off of a common PCB board, which is pretty cool. Once you have the plastic pieces removed, you wanna carefully push the motors up through the frame to remove them. It's important not to push them down as the motor leads are not long enough and you could damage them. The next step, we're gonna detach the motors from the PCB board and we're gonna solder extension wires onto them so we can fit them onto our new frame. You can start by using a standard soldering iron with a fresh tip and solder to simply desolder the current solder leads from the PCB board. Just add some gentle tension to the motor leads and touch it with the iron to melt the solder and disconnect the wire. After this, you're gonna measure out two three inch wires to be used as extensions. You're gonna take those three inch wires and strip the ends. This can be done by taking a simple razor blade and gently brushing the wire covering and then 
using your fingernail to kind of rip it off and exposing the wire. Also, if you're new to soldering, be sure to check out our soldering basics video on our secondary channel called the Tech Channel. We're uploading more and more content to this channel all the time and it's gonna be content that's gonna help you have success in the hobby. Once you have both the wires stripped, you're gonna wanna tin them with a little bit of solder. In other words, you just wanna cover the ends with a little bit of melted solder before you try soldering them together. As you're extending these motor wires, you wanna be sure to pay attention to the colors of them. You wanna make sure that the wires are soldered back onto the PCB board in the appropriate order. Because you pre tin these wires and there's solder covering the tips, all you need to do is touch them together and add a little bit of heat from your soldering iron and they should melt directly together with these. Now it's time to take that motor with its new extension wires and solder it back onto the PCB board the way it was originally soldered. Again, because the soldering pad on the PCB board and the wire are pre-tinned with solder, it should be as easy as just sticking the wire onto the soldering pad and adding a little bit of heat to melt them together and then let go and it should be a solid solder connection. Once you've completed these steps, you can repeat them on the three remaining motors. Again, be sure to pay attention to the wire colors. Red or sometimes white usually means positive and black is always negative. If you accidentally solder the wrong color wire to the wrong pad on the PCB board, it's not the end of the world. It'll just cause the motor to spin in the opposite direction. So if you have trouble when you start trying to fly, keep an eye on your motor direction and also which way the thrust is going. If you find that the air is blowing in the wrong direction on one of your motors, you wanna first check and make sure that you have the right prop on that motor. If it is the right prop and it's still blowing in the wrong direction, that means that your motor is reversed. To reverse your motor, simply unsolder and swap them on the solder pads and re-solder them down. After you're done with the extensions on the motors, it's time to add the electronics to the foam board frame. This is when it starts to get fun. During this step, it's important to remember where the front of the drone is and where the front of the frame is. Remember that the battery charger port and the switch are on the back of the drone and the motor arms with the riser is the back of the frame. You wanna start by adding a small glob of glue into the center of the frame. Flip out the battery from under the PCB board and lay it flat as possible on the base plate of the frame. Next, you wanna add the front motors in a vertical position with a small amount of hot glue. Make sure the top of the motor case is lined up with the foam to make sure that the prop has enough clearance to spin without hitting the foam. Once you're done with the front motors, you're gonna to wanna to repeat that process on the back motors. The only difference is these motors are gonna be horizontal with the motor shaft facing towards the front of the drone. Once you have these motors connected and you're happy with the fit, you can take some scotch tape or some clear packing tape to secure the wires and just kinda of clean up the wires so they don't get caught up in the props. Now we're gonna make a reusable hatch so you can get into the battery charger port and the power switch between flights. Take the remaining piece of foam and tape it to the back motor arm. This is gonna act as a hinge. Now flip it over and cut off the excess to make it flush at the front of the frame. Once it's flush, add a piece of tape to connect the two together. After that, take a razor blade and cut it back open, and then you're gonna add a secondary layer of tape over top of that, folding the end of the piece of tape over to create a tab. This little tape tab is gonna make it easy for you to open and close the hatch over and over again. Now you're gonna take that remaining strip of foam, you're gonna cut two more inches off of it and glue it to the top of the frame. You want to glue this as close to the balance point as possible. Once that is dry, you will use your remaining piece of foam and peel off both sides of paper to make the foam bendable. Center and glue this piece of foam to the 2 inch piece of foam that you just glued to the top of the frame. This is going to act as a balloon brace that's going to attach your frame to your balloon. Once you have the balloon brace glued, now it's time to put the propellers back on the motors. Be sure to make sure that you have the props and the motors in the correct position. Getting the correct motor rotation and prop rotation is crucial to have success in flying. Once your props are on, you can power on the drone and test to see if the air is blowing in the right way. The front motors you will want the air blowing downwards to the ground, and the back motors you will want blowing out back behind the drone. Now we got a party balloon helium tank from the store for about 20 bucks, but if you don't have one, you can typically go to a grocery store or a party store and they should fill up helium balloons for you. The bigger the balloons, the better. However, you can use smaller balloons, but just keep in mind that the more balloons you have, the more mass that the motors will have to push around in the air and the less maneuverable it'll be. Now, we tried a couple different types of balloons and we actually found out of all the ones that we tested, the party balloons actually worked the best. We did use these longer peapod shaped balloons and it actually looked really, really cool. It looked more like a traditional style blimp, but we found that it was actually a little bit harder to drive. It had less authority when you were turning and it's mainly because you have more mass in the latex balloons because there's more balloons holding the helium. For this one, we're gonna use standard party balloons. This build is pretty forgiving, so you can mount the balloons any which way you want. To connect the balloons, we just use scotch tape or packing tape. Whichever tape you use, just pay attention to how it feels, how thick it is, because weight is crucial. 
the lighter the tape, the less amount of balloons that you're gonna need. Keep adding more balloons until the craft becomes positively buoyant. In other words, you want it to float towards the ceiling. Once you get that level of buoyancy, you're going to add ballast. For ballast, we used a couple screws and some nails, but you can use anything such as a Lego character or any common objects that have a little bit of weight to them to kind of balance out the balloon. Keep adding ballast until the balloon becomes negatively buoyant. In other words, you want the balloon to slowly fall towards the ground. The reason for this is because when you add throttle, it's going to force the balloon to go up, and when you cut the throttle it's going to come down giving you control over your altitude. The reason why you want to put enough balloons on it to make it positively buoyant is because it's going to allow you to fly the craft for a little bit longer as the balloons will slowly lose their helium and their buoyancy over time. As the balloons lose their buoyancy you can just simply remove some of the ballast, in our case our nails and our screws, to maintain a good level of buoyancy for maximum flight performance. As for flying your blimp, the controls are actually surprisingly pretty intuitive. Just like flying anything RC, you will need very little input to achieve smooth flight. You don't need to overdo it on the controls. And you'll learn pretty quickly as soon as you start to feel the controls. The entire blimp can actually be flown off of the left stick. Control your throttle with the up and down motion, and then you can turn the blimp left and right just using a little bit of left and right input on the stick. That being said, you don't need much. If you achieve the right amount of negative buoyancy on your blimp, you should need very, very little throttle and input to maneuver the blimp around the room. Once you get really comfortable with flying off the left stick, you can start adding inputs from the right stick. You can start by turning both sticks in the same direction as if they are in parallel with each other and working the throttle at the same time. This is gonna give you a more aggressive turning ability. Beyond that, you can also push the right stick forward while working the throttle to achieve higher forward airspeed. Pull the right stick back while working the throttle to achieve more vertical control without moving forward quite as much. Now here's the cool thing, if you guys want to take the fun to the next level, you can build a second one and share it with a friend. We're strong believers that the hobby is meant to be shared with other people, and not only will you improve your skills faster sharing it with somebody else, but you're going to have much more fun. Fun competitions such as racing or even having air balloon battles in the sky are a great way to use these awesome indoor blimps. Now, as you guys know, we love to do big, huge RC flying projects, and we still plan on continuing to do those into the future, but we had a lot of comments from you guys out there who wanted to see more projects that were approachable that you can do at home. So we hope you enjoyed this RC blimp project. Let us know down in the comments if you plan on building one. Make sure you subscribe yet if you haven't, and we'll see you next time.